Welcome everybody to Hadron Siyum Masechet Bavakama. We're all so excited that you're here. We're so excited to have a reason to celebrate during these difficult times. Uh, our Siyum of Masechet Bavakama is sponsored by the Schuster family in loving memory of Ozer's mother, Devorah Schuster, and is a schut for a completely, a complete lasting peace in Eretz Israel. And it's also sponsored by Alana Friedman in honor of the marriage today of her wonderful niece, Adira Leah Barber, to Yonatan Glixman. May Hashem grant you this chut to build a strong Jewish household steeped in Torah values that will continue our families and our nation's Masora Mazal Tov. And during these difficult times, we will also dedicate our siyum to the safety of our soldiers, to the Jews in Israel, to the Jews all around the world, to the safe return of our hostages in memory of the fallen soldiers, and for Rufu Shlema to all those injured. We are going to start our event with a parak of Tehillim that Rabbi Yael Shimoni is going to lead us in. After that, we will finish the end of the Masechet. I told everybody before, we're only learning the very end today, and we'll kind of wrap up the Masechet. We'll do the Hadrons, then we'll hear a Shi'or from Rabbi Ni El Shimoni, then we'll hear some insights from Terry Kravosha, one of our learners, and then we will end the Siyum with Tfilot for the soldiers, for those injured, and for the hostages. So we'll start with Rabbi Ni El and Tehillim. So I'm going to lead us with uh, Tilim Kuf Kafalf. Shil Amalo Tisayna El Ari Ma'in Yavo Ezrim Ezrim Eim Adonai Oseh Shamaim Baritz Al Yiten Lamot Raglecha Al Yano Shomrecha. הנה לא ינום ולא אישה, שומעים ישראל. אדוני שומריך, אדוני צילך על יד ימיניך. יומם השמש לא יקקה, וירח בלילה. אדוני ישמורך מכל רע, ישמור את נפשך. אדוני ישמור צדך ובואך, מעתה ועד עולם. Yeah. Um, we're now going to get started with the end of our daf. So we're in daf, on daf kuf yud tet, at the very end of the daf. Before we start, I want to ask a few questions and kind of talk about the very, very basic questions that our Gemara is dealing with at the very, very end of our Masechet. Like, how do you buy something in a store without worrying that maybe it's stolen property? How do you bring materials to a seamstress without worrying that maybe she'll steal something from you? Or what if you are a seamstress? How do you worry that maybe if there's some threads left over that it's not considered theft? And all sorts of everyday events. We started our Masechet with our Ba'avot Nizikim, as if there's these four concepts of damages, of things someone could do that's wrong, irresponsible, evil perhaps, right? Really, you know, damaging, hitting someone, beating somebody up, stealing, but we end the Masechet with very basic everyday activities that theoretically all of us could be a thief. And it's almost like putting a mirror in our faces and saying, you know, you think this Masechet's all about the other and, and the evil people or the people who have bad intentions or maybe even, you know, just accidental about it. But, but kind of putting it up there and saying, you know, in our everyday actions, we could actually come to be doing something that may be inappropriate. And then the question is, how do we come up with guidelines for that? And that's really where the last mission starts. The last mission starts telling us guidelines. How do we know? How do we know? Right? It was the interesting part about women selling property of their husbands. And how do they know whether their husbands are okay with them selling it or not okay with them selling it? It was kind of funny that, that you know, a few dinarim the women could have, you know, to, to buy their head covering for them. You know, like that, the husband will probably allow for. And, and all these insights of the rabbis to try to come up with boundaries, guidelines. How do we know? Does it depend where you live? Does it depend what the custom is? Does it depend what's generally done? What are the expectations? What are the assumptions? And really, I think the big word in this section of our Gemara is really about assumptions that we make about people's behavior. And based on where you live, based on what's generally customary, whether you're a man or a woman. If you're a man selling it, we assume you're selling your own stuff. If you're a woman, we assume you're selling your husband's stuff and then we have to start making assumptions. Well, 
what do we think? Do we think the husband would have allowed the wife to sell this? Will we think he wouldn't have? And, and the Gemara comes up with all sorts of guidelines. And, it, you know, if you think about it, it's all about how to prevent these things from happening, which theoretically, as we say in Hebrew, ain't of ourself, right? There is no end to worrying about what we could possibly accidentally be stealing. So they give us all sorts of guidelines, what we assume a launderer accepts and what, you know, what the, the person who brings the clothes assumes that maybe the launderer will take from the clothing and all, all kinds of generalizations about these types of things. But also hidden within this Gemara is all sorts of comments about, well, you know, it's true that we're going to make assumptions, but we know that whenever we make assumptions, there's a weakness there. Not everyone, or we make a generalization, not everybody fits the generalization. It's not always going to be the case. And you particularly get that sense when you end our Masechet. So let's read the last few lines of our Masechet. We're up to the Tanu Rabbanan, a few lines from the bottom. First, they quote a part of the Mishnah, Imayau Se'etza. And that was some of the cases in the Mishnah. But now we're going to start with the new bright. Tanu Rabbanan. Misatete avanim em behem mishum gezel. The stone chiselers... When they chisel off from the stone. Now, if you learned the last stuff, you know that what we're discussing here, like I said about a seamstress, usually you what would happen in those days was you would bring the materials to the person. So if you go to a stone chiseler, you bring your stones, they chisel the stones. So the stone chiseler, there's no concern of gesel, meaning any pieces they chip off the stones, the assumption is the owner is not going to care about getting them back, and therefore they belong to the stone chiseler. Mifaske ilanot. These are people who prune trees. Mifas fanim, if you prune vines. Minak higi, these are people who trim shrubs. Minak shezraim, or odre yirakot. These are people when you plant the vegetables too close to each other, you have to take some out, right? They start growing and then you start removing some of them. So if you remove someone's vegetables, right, again, the question is, does the owner want them back or do they really just want what's growing to be growing properly? And Odre Yerakot are the people who hoe them and move them to the side. So how do we know whether you can buy these from the people? Are they stolen? Are they not stolen? Well, it really depends. And this is where we start getting into, well, so much for all the generalizations we discussed. Now we're going to start saying, well, we have to go and see whether the Balabayit, if it's, again, it's not so clear what this means, Bizman. Does it mean if it's a place where generally they do this, or whether it means we check with the balabai, what what did you want? Did you want them back? Did you want the prunings for yourself? Did you want to just throw them in the garbage? Um, so then if the balabai is makpid and wants them back, yesh my mishum gezel, then you obviously have to return it. Aim balabai makpid alehem hare elu shelo. But if not, you get to keep them. I'm a Rabbi Yehuda. So that's the end of the bright. And now comes Rabbi Yehuda and he says, Kishut v'chaziz em behemishum gezel. This seems to be, there's a bunch of different opinions what exactly it is. It seems to be animal fodder. Usually it's something that grows without being planted in particular. So again, because no one really planted it and it grew in the wild and it's not so expensive, you don't have to worry about it being stolen. But ba'atra the kapte yesh behemishum gezel. But again, they say, oh, but in a place where people are careful about this, there is, you do have to worry about Theft. And again, that means if you're buying it from someone, well, you have to worry that maybe they stole it from someone else. I'm a Ravina, Umatamachasia, Atla de Kaptehu. And just so you know, Matamachasia is a city where people are all very careful about these things, and therefore you actually can't buy unless you know it's from the owner. Otherwise, you have to be concerned that somebody stole it. So again, our Mishnah and, and the beginning and most of the Gemara until now really was giving all of these general rules, whereas at the end, and even a little bit before in the Sigya, we start to see that there's a little bit of a problem of making all these generalizations because like all rules, we know there's exceptions to the rule. On the other hand, we have a system and we have a system of law and a legal system. And we'll hear later this evening from Terry Kurosh, who's a lawyer who will give her perspective from you know an actual lawyer and not someone who actually thought of being a lawyer at some point, but uh, which always reminds me of this when we learn Masefto like Baba Kama, why I like them so much. But the a legal system needs rules and generalizations, even if, and I think at the end of this Masechet, I actually wanted to look back, but there was another Masechet where I discussed this issue, where the Masechet kind of ends with realizing all of the weak points of these generalizations and realizing that as much as we need a legal system to create rules, 
there's weaknesses and we have to be cognizant of the fact that there's much, there's more nuance than we think. But it's hard to end this Masecha without thinking about that really the last half is all about these assumptions. And it obviously made me think about the story of Rabbi Yochanan and uh, Rav Kahana that we learned just a few days ago. And that story is really all about making assumptions, meeting someone, Rabbi Yochanan meets Rav Kahana. I'm not going to go through all the details of the story because we already learned it, but I'll remind you of some of the very interesting details. Rabbi Yochanan, right, Rav, Rav Kahana is sent away. He kills somebody. He has to run away. He's sent to, to, uh, to Israel with one strict rule. You are not allowed to ask questions of Rabbi Yochanan. So first he starts asking questions before Rabbi Yochanan comes in and people say, wow, great gadol. And they tell Rabbi Yochanan and Rabbi Yochanan has huge expectations. And then, all, but probably also a little hesitant because he is a Babylonian and you see throughout that, that Rabbi Yochanan is a little bit negative about the Babylonians. Um, there's that comment where he says, did you see what that Babylonian did to me? And, and he wants to hear what he has to say. And Rav Kahana doesn't say anything. So the first assumption he makes is, okay, this person didn't open his mouth. He didn't ask any questions. He obviously must not be as smart as people say he is. Then he looks at his, he um, he also, the first assumption really he makes is that he came from Babylonia. That's number one. We make an assumption, which is interesting because it's the same thing, how we end the Masechet. The people from Matamachatsia are like this. And, and we talked before in the Gemara, the people in this city do like this. So he made a certain assumption, you're from Babylonia, you already see at the end of the, the story that he obviously thought that the rabbis in Israel had a better hold, a grasp on the Torah than the ones in Babylonia. So number one, he judges him from where he comes from. Number two, he judges him from his behavior. that He doesn't ask any questions, he must not be very smart. And then toward the second part of the story, he judges him by the crack in his lips and he thinks that he's mocking him. And that's really the worst because judging by people's appearances is act, you know, can be really detrimental. And in this case, it actually causes Rav Kahana to die. And then throughout the whole story, we see Rabbi Yochanan gets lowered. He has to go down off his seven cushions. Then he has to go in and plead for mercy and try to convince the snake to let him in. And until he says, I'm the student and he's the Rav, that snake is not letting him in. And basically Rabbi Yochanan has to undo all the assumptions that he made about Rav Kahana. And what we see here and the, and the climax of the story is when he says at the end of the story, he says to his students, he says, uh, let me just open it. He says, Dilchon Amre, he, they, they actually quote, it says, and, and this story is highlighted in the words that Rabbi Yochanan says, always, you know, it's a, a line that he says, Dilchon Amre, Dilchon He. I used to think it was us who had the hold on the Torah. And I realize now it's the Babylonians. And this big admission at the end that I was really wrong about how I judged, number one, the Babylonians, how I judged Rav Kahana. And, and I think that what really our Masechet is ending with is that while in the legal system, we might need to make assumptions and we need, and, and understanding that there's some weaknesses in making these assumptions, but in a, in a social environment and in, in the world that we live in, we can't make those assumptions. We're, we can't look at people and start judging them by who they are, how they dress, where they come from, even how they behave or how they look right, that we have to be very cautious about judging people by all sorts of outside, um, by all sorts of things. So I think it's a very interesting message to take with us, particularly during these complicated times about, you know, realizing that while generalizations are important, one has to be very wary of them, certainly in interpersonal relations. And I think there we have that, this comparison at the end of the Masechah, the contrast between the the, the assumptions that Rabbi Yochanan makes versus the assumptions that the halachic system needs to make. And with that, Hadron Halacha goes Abatra, Uslik Gala, Mesechet Bavakam. Mazal Tov, and we will now recite the Hadrons. Share my screen so that we can see it here. Okay, everybody ready? Hadron Alach, Mesechet Bavakam, Bahadra Halan. Da'atan alach mesechet bavakama v'da'ata chalan. Lo nitneshe minach mesechet bavakama v'lo titneshe minan. Lo ba'al mahaden v'lo ba'al ma'da'ate. Let me say this three times. Hadran alach mesechet bavakama v'hadra chalan. Da'atan alach mesechet bavakama v'da'ata chalan. Lo nitneshe minach mesechet bavakama v'lo titneshe minan. 
לא בעלמא הדין ולא בעלמא דעתי. הדרן הלך מסכת בבא קמא והדרך עלן, דעתן הלך מסכת בבא קמא ודעתך עלן, לא נתנשי מנך מסכת בבא קמא ולא תתנשי מנן, לא בעלמא הדין ולא בעלמא דעתי. יהי רצון מלפניך אדוני אלוהינו ואלוהי אבותינו שתהא תורתך אומנותנו בעולם הזה ותהא עמנו לעולם הבא. חנינה בר פאפה, רמי בר פאפה, נחמן בר פאפה, אחי בר פאפה, אבא בר פאפה, רפרם בר פאפה, רכיש בר פאפה, סורחה בר פאפה, עדה בר פאפה, דרו בר פאפה. הערב נא אדוני אלוהינו את דברי תורתך בפינו ופיפיות עמך בית ישראל, ונהיה אנחנו כולנו צאצאינו וצאצאי עמך בית ישראל, כולנו יודעי שמך ולומדי תורתך לשמה. מאהבי תחכמני מצוותיך, כי לעולם היא לי. יהי ליבי תמים בחוקיך למען לא אבוש. לעולם לא אשכח פיקודיך, כי בם חייתני. ברוך אתה אדוני למדני חוקיך. אמן, 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 סלע ועד. יהי רצון מלפניך, אדוני אלוהי, כשם שעזרתני לסיים מסכת בבא קמא, כן תעזרני להתחיל מסכתות וספרים אחרים ולסיימם, ללמוד וללמד, לשמור ולעשות, ולקיים את כל דברי תלמוד תורתך באהבה. וזכות כל התנאים והמוראים ותלמידי חכמים יעמוד לנו ולזרענו, שלא תמוש התורה מפינו ומפי זרענו עד עולם. ויתקיים בנו, ויתהלכך תנחה אותך, ושוכבך תשמור עליך, והקיצותה היא תשיחך. כי בי ירבו ימיך, ויוסיפו לך שנות חיים, אורך ימים בימינה, שמאלה אושר וכבוד, אדוני עוז לעמו ייתן, אדוני ברך את עמו בשלום. מזל טוב to everybody. Mazel tov, mazel tov. Um, I want to just first of all point out how amazing it is to have people from all around the world at the Siyam. Always it amazes me, especially watching everybody right where you're from and all that. And I wanted to just tell everybody how, for, I know that this was number one, a complicated masechet, a difficult time to be focusing on learning. I know a lot of people were having issues with everything going on and being able to put in the time and the focus to learn. So first of all, I want you to be proud of Whatever you accomplish, whether you finished the Masechet, whether you did part of the Masechet, um, be proud of what you were able to do. I wanted to share with you a message I received this morning from a woman who basically said to me that it was hard to get up in the mornings and knowing that she was going to wake up to the learning every day really gave her a, a very strong anchor and a, and a push to get up every day. And uh, I know I felt the same way myself, and I know a lot of you feel that way. And I think we should really be blessed that we live in a time where we're able to have this anchor um, and that we can really hold on to that. And if you didn't finish the Masechet, Baba Metzi is a great place to start. And don't worry about what you didn't do. There's always, tomorrow is a new day. You can always put it somewhere on a list and, and get back to it at some point. But start Baba Metzi. Don't, don't get stuck in, as we call, daf debt. That's our joke in our house. Um, so that, those are my... Short words for tonight. I want to um, just say that we're thrilled to have Rabbi El Shimoni with us tonight. She is the co Rosh Yeshiva of, of Yeshiva Trisha, which my three of my daughters have had the pleasure of learning there. And really, it's a, it's a pleasure. I love having, hearing them come home with the excitement of learning and the amount of skills that they've gained in the Yeshiva. So uh, it's a real honor to have Rabbi El with us. She also teaches a weekly shear for Hadron called Gefet, which took a break for a little while. And Bezrat Hashem is going to start up again with Baba Metziah. So, um, and we have a very relevant topic for tonight called, Can We Undo the Past? Oh, it's so wonderful to be here and to see so many participants. And uh, as Reverend Michel said, the topic is, can we undo the past? And I'm sure that when you hear these words, uh, they echo in two different ways. They echo uh, because we're dealing with, with wondering, how can we undo the past? Can we undo the past of, uh, of the last month? Ever since Simchat Torah. 
Uh, but this is really a topic that the Masechta is dealing with and Rishonim and Achronim. And I wanted to share with you uh, thoughts which are rather heavy. Um, heavy, I mean, in, in Lundish, uh to, to see how really Rishonim and Achronim dealt with this question when we are trying to pay for Nazikim and somebody has been hurt, hurt because of us, because of our interaction, uh, different kinds of hurt we see in the Masechta. And we're giving him money or repaying all kinds of debts to, to the other person. What are we doing? Are we really trying uh, to undo the past? Is that really an option? And uh, we know the four nezikim, avot nezikim, shov bo mav'eh ve'hev'el. And all of the above deal with when one person or or any one of these four is hurting another man's mamun. What does that mean? I'm not hurting the other person's body. I'm hurting um, things that he owns. And there is one parak, parak the eighth parak, where we start to deal with what happens if somebody hurt a person's body. And these are two different discussions in the Gemara, and I want us to look at both. So let's begin with the question, what happens if somebody's um, gechush, his house, his, his cattle, uh, his belongings have been destroyed or, or hurt? So what happens according to Masechta? We have to pay. Hon, you're you're chayav. Uh, a man is chayav uh, in Ezekiel. There are all kinds of, of different ways to be chayav, and all kinds of pturim that you learned. But the question is, when I pay somebody for damaging him, how much money do I decide to pay that person and when? So there are two very big questions that the post came in our times uh, uh, we're dealing with. Because in this idea that I hurt another person's uh, belongings and then I pay, usually I would think if I would ask any one of you, the reason I pay money is because I'm trying to, uh, to, 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 to undo the past. Let's say I, I, I burn somebody's house. Okay, so I would I would like to give him enough money to, to rebuild his house, right? I'm I'm trying to give in Hebrew you say pitzuim. Uh, I'm trying to give money, so, so so somehow things will be repaired. But if we look at uh, the halachot, we see that that's not exactly the case. There are two very big issues uh, that we see throughout the Gemara. One is the question of of grama ben Eziki, uh, that if if any hurt that I uh, do to another person, I'm just trying to, to repay the hurt and make him somehow feel better and, and rebuild his life, it wouldn't matter if I'm hurting him directly or indirectly. And yet we see throughout a lot of halachot that if it's indirect damage, uh, what's called gemara, and indirect is not so indirect, just a little far from direct damage, then suddenly I'm patr. That's a very big sugya, and we will not go into that sugya. That would be a different shear of grammar than Ezekiel. But I want to deal with, with another issue. Uh, you've all, most of you learned Shen. And Shen, we know that if uh, if if somebody eats, if, if I have uh, cattle eating in somebody's house, so then you're chai, right? But if it's uh, in the street, you're patul. Shen, bilshut rabim patul, bilshut nizak chaya. So let's just imagine uh, my dog, is eating your uh, vegetable patch, okay? Um, so how much money would I have to pay you? And if we read the sugya, we see something very, very disturbing. The sugya in Baba Kama, uh, the Aleph, says that I decide on the payment uh, not according to how much I, I've damaged, which is what I would think, but I, ha I have a different calculation, and that calculation is very, very, very disturbing. So those of you who have the Makor can look with me, and those who don't, I'll, I'll just read the Gemara, and I'll translate as I go along. So we're in Baba Kama Da'ah. וכן אתה מוצא בקוטה הידו של עבדו של חברו, וכן אתה מוצא במזיק שדה של חברו. So Rav says here 
that uh, let's say I I had uh, um, my animal eat or hurt my my Evid's hand. Okay, or let's say I I I I destroyed. Um, I hurt one of your animals and, and now she, she lost her baby. So how much do I have to pay? What I would think is that uh, if, if you had a cow and that cow was supposed to be giving birth, so I would have to pay um, the, uh, the value of, of what was lost, which means that the cow that was supposed to be given birth to. But suddenly Rava says, no, that's not what you do. You look at the cow. You see how much that cow costs now and how much it costs when it was pregnant. And that's the amount that you pay. You have to understand it's a much lesser amount. Let me just describe it in uh, something that's more connected to our world. Um, what would happen if, if, if I would come to your car and I would uh, 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 destroy one of your wheels? Okay, how much does a wheel cost? Let's say in Israel, 500 shekels uh, you have to pay for, for one wheel. Sometimes if you add the other one because it hurts the car, so so it's one thousand. But if I take the entire car, how much does a car cost? It can cost, let's say, a hundred thousand. So a car with a wheel or without a wheel, will that make a big difference in selling the car? Nothing. You wouldn't pay more for or less, much less for a car, uh, let's say a Tesla, just because one of its wheels wasn't working, right? Because you're selling the entire car. So the small damage would just be consumed because you're talking about a, a much larger damage to the entire car. Another example, uh, let's say um, one of my kids took a rock and, and threw it on the Buckingham Palace and, and broke one of the windows. How much does a window in Buckingham Palace cost? I guess a lot, but if I would sell the entire palace, a palace with a broken window or without a broken window, would that make a difference? It wouldn't change the amount that you would pay for the palace. And that's what Rava says. Rava says, I don't pay for what I hurt. I look at the entire piece. I look at the entire cow. I look at the entire uh, uh, the field. I look at the entire person. And that's how I, I decide how much I pay. This is a decision that will cause everybody to pay much less uh, than what we would expect. The money that you would receive would not be enough to fix the damages that were uh, caused to you. Why does Rava say that? So Rava explains himself and he says, uh, uh, Says Rava, when one person hurt another person, another person's uh, um, a mammon, Yael, I, I, I threw a rock and I broke your window. So why won't I have to pay for repairing the window? I'll tell you why. Because it will cost too much money for Yael. It will be too much for her. She's not getting paid a lot for, for teaching Gamar. Uh, and we don't want her to, to lose a lot of money. So, so we'll decide to give her uh, a different amount. That's a very strange thing that Rava says, and and Rav Acha asks many years later. He asks Ravashi. Rav Acha Bered Rava asks Ravashi. Okay, so 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 Yael's going to lose a, a lot of money. So what? If according to the law, I'm I broke something, I should pay for what I broke. Um, my. I destroyed something, so so I have to repair it. What, why? Because I'm going to lose money? Because it's hard for me to pay? That's why we're not making me pay the entire amount? How, how could that be? And the Gemara's answer, Says the Gemara, says Rav Ashi, because it is a deen, because in truth, any damage, you can definitely look at it in two ways. When I uh, destroy a window, did I hurt the window or did I hurt the house? This is a real serious question. On one hand, I hurt the window. On the other hand, I hurt the house because the only meaning, the meaning of the window is because it's part of the house. So this is not, not according to Dean. This is just another way to look at the Dean. And we choose this way instead of the other way. So this Gemara, it's very, very hard because after we learned, oh, we learned finally, you know, somebody pays 
for his Nazikim, we suddenly find out that the amount that a person pays is a very low amount because of this way of calculating um, the payment. And this amount has caused a lot of Koskim uh, nowadays to feel very uneasy because many, many, many situations, uh, you will see that a person will pay nothing. Um, let's give another example. From this Gemara, the Nativot in uh, the Shulchan Aruch was asking that whenever you have to pay for damaging, you have to see what's the cost of what you hurt by seeing how much it costs to sell it. So if you'll damage my hat, we have to see how much, uh, what's the market for this hat. If you damage my glasses, you have to see what's the market for my glasses. Now this hat, when I... I brought it was, I don't know how much. Now that I'm wearing it, it's already secondhand. How much does it cost? Much less. My glasses, can I sell them to anyone? These are very personal glasses. Nobody here, how many are we? Well, almost 200. Nobody here would pay any money for buying these glasses because they're only made for me, for El Shimoni. So if the Nativot is right, um, many, many things that you can damage me, you'll pay nothing for. And he's actually asking this Halacha in the Shulchan Aruch. And, and that's a very, very strange pasking. And if we read the Nativot and also the Mishnah Burah quotes in the Chatz uh, that even if you did damage someone, you don't really have to pay unless what you damage to something is goods that he could actually sell them on the market. And I think that's very, very, very disturbing. When you just when you read, when you learn the masachet and you, and you get to Dach Mem Zayin and you read this and then you see it in the Shulchan Aruch, it's it's, uh, it's shocking. And and how do we understand? That? So I want to show you two different ways of uh, of understanding this. One way uh, will be pretty surprising, and it's actually a text from uh, Rav Kook. Rav Kook writes. Uh, regarding Hilchot uh, Nezikim. And he has a, a very interesting text. Uh, I, I was taught this text by, by my husband, Rav Shimon Shimoni. And I remember the first time I read it, and I was so so surprised that Rav Kook says, Yeah, you're learning Baba Kama. You, you didn't understand. Uh -huh. you, you thought that what you're learning is the uh, the laws of Torah, how, how you help somebody uh, repair the damages that you caused them, that's wrong. So I'll, I'll read the Rav Kook, those who have him, it's it's a text from Al-Pile uh, Toal. And, and uh, I'm repeating, this is, a, this is a very, very rare text, okay? Most of what we'll see will go against Rav Kook, but I want to start from him because he, he opens our minds to, to an interesting thought. So Rav Kook, the following. Uh, Okay, Rav Kook says, you should know that all the laws uh, Rabbi Benit Michel called the, 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 the laws that lawyers deal with, when you see the Torah's laws uh, of, of how to work with society, social law, especially if you're talking about Nazikim, they have two uh, different sources in a soul, a good source and a bad soul. Uh, what's the good and what's the bad? The good The good source of Nezikim, the real source of Nechot Nezikim, is that if I hurt you, if I burn your house, if I destroy your window or your Tesla or whatever, the problem is that I need to do tshuva. And that's why I should pay you money because I need to do tshuva, I need to do repentance. That's the good source of Nezikim. The bad source. Hasheni ba mitoch tsarut ayin. Shaish ha'acher enon leenot mi sheli o lingoa b'sheli. Mitnei shahargasha shel ha'sheli v'shel ha'ani chazaka o megushemet v'en shi'u. Says Rav Kook, if I want somebody to pay me because I was hurt, that's bad. That's bad. Yeah, you shouldn't take your uh, your belongings so seriously. If somebody hurt your belongings, no, no, that's what God wanted. That's no big deal. The fact that you're lacking is not the reason why God said that somebody else 
has to pay. The only reason that a mazik needs to pay is because he needs to repent, not because he needs to help the other person undo the past. Because it's uh, it's it's only it, it, it's only mammon, it's only money, it's only a house, it's only a car, it's only a cow. No big deal. Don't take it so seriously. That's not what we're discussing. And that's bad, says Rav Kook. Rav Kook says, don't, don't mix the dinim of the Torah and the dinim of, of, of regular law. Lawyers, uh, they care about money. That's why they have make people pay a lot of money. That's bad. The Torah doesn't want people to pay money to, to help other people. It's, it's not about, it's not about the, the nizak. It's all about the masi. So that's Rav Kook. So according to Rav Kook, according to this to this idea, we shouldn't be surprised that the Ilkhot of Nezikin don't help the person who was hurt. Because they were never supposed to do that. They were only supposed to tell the, the person who hurt the other person to, to beware and that he's doing something bad. But it's not, the money is not really there to help the other side um, to rebuild his life after whatever catastrophe happened. And of course, these words of Rav Kook are very, very, very strange and, and hard to accept, even though we see uh, many times when uh, when uh, Rabbanim and Achronim and philosophers, uh, Jewish philosophers, try to understand the laws of the Torah, a lot of times they reach that and they say, no, you have to understand the laws of the Torah are not like the usual law. Uh, they're not there to help people. They're there just to make people become better in front of God. For example, why do we give tzedakah? It's not to help other people. Tzedakah is to help ourselves. So we'll be uh, righteous. Okay, like that's one way to look at the at the laws of the Torah. But what I want to show you is that many poskim nowadays looked at this sugya and said, "This can't be. This can't be true. We have to find a different way." to calculate how much damage uh, we have people to pay because uh, they don't agree with Rav Kook and they have to find a way to read the sugiya differently. So I have here a few people. I don't know if you know all of them. Uh, one of them is rather famous uh, nowadays, Rav Asher Weiss. But, uh, but I wanted to start from uh, Chazonish, which is also uh, very famous, and, uh, and Rav Shlomo Zalman Oyerbach. And uh, uh, then gets a reverse reverse. So each one of these gdolim, which are all gdolim of our times, uh, looked at the schidish of the netivot and said the netivot is wrong. Um, he, he did not learn well the sugiya, we're cholak on him. Uh, if, if I destroy your window, I will have to pay for the repair of the window, not for the amount of how much the house is less with the window. Even though Rava said what he said in the Sukhi. How do they do it? So let's start with um, with the Chazanish. Yeah, the Chazanish said, uh, and I'm reading in Shut Or Letzion. Uh, Or Letzion is uh, Rav Ben Zion Abba Shaul. And, and he starts by saying that uh, the Chafetz Chaim was asking, like I described, that if it if I broke a window, then, then I'll, I'm just going to have to pay the amount that the house went down, which is really nothing. And, and, and that's what it says here in Shura Ritzion. Okay? People who read, who learned Baba Kama well, learned Baba Kama Biyu, might get uh, to the Maskana, the halachic decision. That if somebody breaks a window, he doesn't have to pay because it's not very expensive. Uh, the house doesn't lose from from uh, its amount, and, and it's selling a house without a window or with a window will not make it. But the Chazanish says, "Al shut all the is holy." The Rav Chazanish katav v'zel shonu v'nirei the kevan den ba'it omed lemitzira ella letaken. So the Chazanish said, we have to look at reality. 
if I'm now trying to sell a house, that is true. If this house is on market, the fact that you broke a window, uh, you won't have to pay. But if somebody breaks a window in my house, and I'm, my house is not on market, I'm planning to live there for a long time. It's not on sale. So then, if somebody broke a window in my house, because it's not on sale, we have to see how much money I'm planning to, to put on repairing the house. And that's what that person will have to pay. So the Chazanish very easy, easily does what we call an okimta. What does that mean? He's reading the sugya in, in uh, uh, Baba Kama Zayn, and it says, all that Rava said is only dealing with something that's on sale. But if something is not on sale, it's in use. We have to see how much a person who's using it will spend in order to find the exact same thing to spend again. So if somebody will break my glasses because they're in use, he will have to pay me the amount that I will go and pay for glasses myself because I'm using them. But if I'm uh, a store that sells glasses, then he won't have to pay the same amount. So that's a big chiddush of the chazonish, but let's understand the chiddush. The chazonish says that when you pay somebody money, you're really paying the person. We're not looking at my glasses as, it's like an idea of glasses. We're checking, are these glasses glasses that I'm wearing or am I selling them? And that will make a big difference of how much I pay. So the Chazonish is saying, Mamash hafuch from Rav Kook. Because the Chazonish says, when the Torah decides how much you pay, the Torah wants you to look at the person that you hurt. Not only at, at the object, but what does the object mean to the person? And what the object means to the person that will change the amount of money that you will have to pay. And that's why Dafka things that are in use, you'll end up paying more for than things that are for sale. A similar thing says Rishul Muzalman Oyerbach. He also found this uh, halacha uh, very hard. And he asks, he says, I, I don't understand this. How could this be? How could the Tivot Shalom be passing like this, I, I'm cholek. And, and he says, according to, to this idea of the Netivot Shalom, let, let's imagine that you, you, you didn't break my glasses. You walked into my house and took a letter that somebody wrote to me, and you tear the letter. Do you have to pay? A letter is a sentimental thing. Okay, how much does a letter cost? Nothing, right? A piece of paper. Do you have to pay for tearing somebody's letters? Let's say a love letters that somebody has, or letters from his children, or or somebody who passed away, and he and he ha and he has a piece of writing, and so, and somebody was destroying that piece of writing. Does he pay? So it says Reb Shlomo, I think he has to pay. Why? Because you have to see how much. That means to me. You don't see how much it costs to buy a piece of paper in the store. You have to see how much it means to Yael. And says with Shlomo Zaman Orbach, and he quotes a different Gemara, the Gemara in the Fiud, if I'm not mistaken, that the Torah said, Makeh nefesh be'ema yeshalmena. Yeshalmena means lehashlim, to make it whole. So Shlomo Zaman says, you have to understand that the rules of Nezikim are there to make somebody whole. They're not, they're not talking about the value of something for sale. They're talking about the value to the specific person. So here we're dealing with a big question. How do we repair the past? So according to Rishlomo Zaman, according to Chazanish, and also according to, um, to Rasher Weiss, which I'll get into in a moment, you have to see the damage from the damaged person's eyes. And that's how you decide how much you pay the person. And it's true that Brava said what he said, but he described a salesman. When you sell things, then you're only interested in, in how much other people want to buy them. But when you hurt somebody's personal belongings, that's costly. So that's what the Chazanish said, and also Rav Shlomo Zalman. 
Rav Asher Weiss, it's harder for him to say it so straightforward. He 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 feels uneasy because Rav really said what he said, and 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 Chazanish said, big problem I have with this is let's say somebody somebody destroyed uh, my cell phone, okay, and on my cell phone I had uh, pictures of of my mother who passed away, okay, so that's that's hard for me to lose a cell phone. So I, I might say, wow, this cell phone for me is worth a million shekels. So now the other person will have to pay a million shekels. That, that doesn't make sense, says, says Rav Asher Price, because if you're going to to subjective meanings of, of things, then, then you, you can really lose it. So Rav Asher Price says, in these cases, debate the needs to look and, and, and make a decision and, and do something rational that makes sense. You can't really go to the subjective uh, feeling of somebody towards, I don't know, his grandparents' uh, sofa or a special uh, art piece that is not worth a lot, but it's just very sentimental. You'll get nowhere. You, you can't do the Dinan Azikim that way. So, so, so you have to somehow work your way between what other people would actually pay for something like that and what would be a rational thing to ask for. Uh, in repayment for something personal that has been destroyed. So I'm just summing up the first part before we go into damaging of, of a person's body. Okay, because if we're talking about uh, hurting somebody's house, so we see a house is, is a space where you live in, but it's also filled with sentimental value. And, and that's why how much payment will you have to pay for the house? It's not only how much you would pay for this, but you also have to see what it means to this person to have his house destroyed. And that would be a different way of making a decision how much to pay. And, that, and that's what the Chazan Nation, Rosh Lama Zalman, and Russia Weiss uh, say that you have to do, even though the Gemara, uh, it sounded that you will have to pay nothing if you, if you destroyed somebody's personal belonging. So that was the first part of looking at this question, understanding that the meaning of, of, of objects is more than just how much they cost to sell, that, that, that the sentimental value has its own, uh, its own money. <laughs> and, and if we look at that, we see that you can't really repair uh, uh, sentimental value, but you do have to take it into account when you're trying to pay somebody for the damage that that has happened to him. So that's when somebody hurts objects. What happens if somebody hurts my body? So here, the Gemara says something totally different. At the end of Perikah Hovel, says the Gemara, that even if you pay somebody money, you are not forgiven until you have asked his repentance. You have to say you're sorry. And they learned that from Sarah and Avimelech. And the Gemara says that even if you paid a ton of money. Uh, you still have to say you're sorry. And there's a very big discussion. Why? Why is it so different when you hurt somebody's body? And why are you asking somebody to say that they're sorry? And this goes to an even deeper point when you learn Perka Chovel. The beginning of Perka Chovel, and I understand Rabbi Chana taught us here regarding that. It's a very famous beginning and strange beginning of the Perak that the Torah says, Ein tachat ein. And Chazal say, oh no, ein tachat ein? no, 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 they mean money. You don't take eyes out, you don't take ears out, you pay money. But the Torah said that you have to take another person's eye out. So why? If really what the Torah meant was that if somebody took my eye out, I have to get money for it. Why did the Torah write these passages describing this, this horrible nekama that we take each other's eyes out? Well, what's the idea behind it? So a famous philosopher, famous nowadays, uh, Immanuel Levinas, wrote about that, that, that the reason that the Torah wrote that a person has to have his eye taken out is not because that's what the Torah thinks has to be. Definitely the Torah thinks that you have to get money if you lost your eyesight. So why write it that way? Says Levinas, because you have to understand that the minute you give payment for hurting somebody's body, you have created justice that is good for the strong and for the rich. If I have a lot of money, I'll just hurt your bodies and pay you money. No problem. Because if money can solve the issue, 
And if money can repair the past, then rich people will just hurt other people and pay them. So the Torah comes and says, you have to know that money cannot fix hurt. Never. It's true. We want you to pay because that will help somebody get better. But don't elude yourself. That's the least you could do is to pay back. It's not really uh, fixing the past. And that's why you have to say you're sorry. But even after you said you're sorry, you still didn't fix the past. Because when you hurt somebody, especially if you hurt their body, the truth is it cannot really be repaired. Never, ever. And that's what the Torah wants to tell us. So going back to my question, can we repair the past? I'm saying hard things here. No, we can't. We can't undo what happened. But that doesn't mean we can't do anything. There is a way to help people overcome damage. It will never be the same, but we have to give them money and we have to give them our passion and we have to help them to make them grow and to, to get well. But the hurt will always be there. And that's very hard to hear because when you hurt somebody, you all you want is just to fix it as if it never happened, but that will never be the case. But I want to finish with a very interesting statement at the end of the eighth parrot. The last thing that the Gemara has to tell us is that even though the best way to repair the past is to give you money and then to say you're sorry, a person who did not get uh, anybody to say that they're sorry can't pray to God and say, please, God, may you hurt him back. That is not allowed, says the Gemara. The Gemara says, if you pray for a person for well-being, so then you'll be answered first. Like when Abraham prayed for Abimelech, he was answered first. But if you pray against somebody and want to have him revenged by God, God will revenge on you first. So that's a very interesting statement of the Gemara because it says, and I'll conclude with that, that when I'm hurt by someone, the most dangerous thing that can happen is that I will hurt him back. Because what will happen then? He hurt me, I'll hurt him back, and then there'll be no end to this, and nothing will be repaired, and everything will just go down the drain, worse and worse and worse. So we have to hold ourselves and understand that when hurt has taken place, we can never totally repair it. But we have to be very, very careful for making it worse so even when we're in the hardest time we always have to be careful not to go down the slope but always climb up and find a way to do the best we can in order to repair what has been damaged so Bezrat Hashem I pray that we won't forget that because I know that many times we we, we wish that things that bad things that happen um, hurt in, in body hurt in in, in, in objects, we would want it all to go away, but things can't can't be undone. We have to deal with them to the best we can. And what the Torah does and what Baba Kama teaches us is that even if we can't undo the past, we have to do the best we can in order to fix the future. So Bezrat Hashem, I hope the learning of Baba Kama will, will help us with that. Wow, very relevant, very important words to be said. Thank you, Rabbi Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, before we move on to the next part, I want to make a few short announcements. First of all, I want to thank my amazing staff, Maggie Sandler and Mimi Shafat for being behind the scenes, making everything happen, in front of the scenes, behind the scenes, making sure that the DAF goes up every day, making sure that the CM happens and, and everything else around it. Um, we also have a new addition to our staff, Kamital Shoval, who you might remember from Daf Michelle Hen. She's going to be uh, an educational project manager, and she started 
her first project with with the Megillah Challenge, which attracted one over 1,300 women to the program. So it's really been amazing. And a lot of young learners as well, which is really the goal. Um, there'll be a CM in two weeks. If anybody wants to join, you can look while well, the publicizing details. If you don't have your bookmarks for Baba Mitzia, for Nazikin, really, anyone who has Nazikin has Baba Mitzia. If you don't have them, if you didn't get them for some reason, please let us know. Um, the registration is, is back up, so you can find it on the website. If you're not yet part of one of our Hadron communities, you should really join. It's a nice way to meet people in person or at least communicate through WhatsApp with people locally, um, which, speaking of communities, I was honored this summer to be able to be in Minneapolis. I was able to go to a few different communities, Seattle, Florida. Um, in New York also, and uh, and Minneapolis. And I met a wonderful group of people in Minneapolis, and they have a weekly Daf Yomi group that meets uh, men and women, and it's called the Hadron Daf Yomi, and they, and they get together and they discuss the Daf, and, and Terry Kravoshu is going to be speaking for us as one of the people who often gives the Daf, and Shira Krebs, I have all the facts correct, seem to run the group. And, and Terry's also a lawyer, and I thought it would be great to have her speak and bring her insight into, into what we learned. Thank you, Rabbanit Michelle, and thank you also to Rabbanit Shimoni for her words. I'm going to think about them for a long time. Um, I want to dedicate my talk today to the success and safety of our soldiers, to the safe return of the captives, in memory of those who have fallen, and for Rufuash Lema to all those who are injured. I also want to dedicate my talk to Dr. Judith Howman, who was my first Talmud teacher in 1977. After learning Talmud from her during my sophomore year in college, I am sure I thought that studying Talmud was the exclusive province of women. One of the classes first year law students take, uh, are required to take is a class in torts. Torts are acts or failures to act that cause harm to persons or property. Torts was one of my favorite classes in law school, and you're thinking, how could that be? Um, it was more understandable than some of the more arcane classes that we were required to take, like property or contracts. In torts, one party takes an action or omits to take an action, and the other party or property is injured. The question often revolves around who in the dispute was negligent. Negligence means whether a party took proper care in doing something. Failure by a party to take proper care means that party is negligent. So in our study of Baba Kama, a muad ox, one who had hurt another ox or human at least three times was considered forewarned, which meant that the owner of the ox had an obligation to mitigate or reduce the damages the ox could cause. Many torts cases, including those in our Masechet, Masechet are decided based on whether or not one party was negligent and whether there was a duty for the injured party or the party responsible for the injury to have taken an action or omitted to take an action to mitigate the risk of the negligence. Think about the stop, look, and listen rule. So for those of you who are too young to remember railroad crossings without safety arms, they often, and who grew up in America, I might add, um, they often had a signpost with an X on the top and on the crossbars was written, stop, look, and listen. I tested this out with my millennial son who had no idea what it, what, where it came from. The rule was developed by a train engineer who thought those three words associated with a train would allow immigrants to understand its intent and pay attention to their warning. However, many of you may not know it was actually used to adjudicate cases. Imagine the rail crossing with a safety arm. One of the first cases, or I'm sorry, imagine the, the, the um, rail crossing without a safety arm. One of the first cases to use the stop, look, and listen rule was decided in 1858 when a cow herder in Pennsylvania sued a railroad for the loss of 300 cattle when the train ran over the cattle as the cow herder sought to drive them across a railroad track. The cattle were on the track as the train approached and the cattle met the moving train. Who was negligent? The cow herder or the train engineer? The court held that the cow herder had a duty to stop and look out for trains and could not rush heedlessly nor remain unnecessarily on a spot over which the law allows trains to run. In fact, the court called trains, which were fairly new at the time, um, engines of fearful power to be propelled by one of the most resistless agents of nature. So distill, to distill down this decision, the rule was that since an individual 
knew the dangerousness of a train, similar to the Muad Ox, they were obligated to do what a prudent individual would have done in the situation to mitigate the damage. He should have stopped, looked, and listened before crossing. The issue of foreseeability always comes up in these cases. And the question that is asked is whether a person could or should have reasonably foreseen the harms that resulted. Should the cow herder have stopped before he began to herd his cows over the tracks and looked and listened for an approaching train? If resulting harms were not foreseeable or a plaintiff failed to mitigate a foreseeable risk, a defendant might successfully prove that they weren't liable. In both the stop, look, and listen case and the case of the Muad Ox, the courts and the Talmud have held that it's reasonable that the ox owner or the cattle herder should have foreseen the damage the Muad Ox, uh, the, the Muad, the Muad Ox could have done or the risk that the cattle would have been killed. The owner of the Muad Ox by more carefully guarding the ox and the cow herder by not advancing the cattle across the tracks uh, if after stopping, looking, and listening, he thought a train was coming. So as a merger and acquisitions lawyer, much of what I do is help my clients understand the risk they take as buyers or sellers of businesses. As sellers, clients wanna walk away from a transaction and make sure they have no liability after the business is sold. Conversely, as buyers, clients wanna make sure that any liabilities that resulted from the time before they bought the business are not their problem as buyers and they can get reimbursed from them by the sellers. So, um, it, it it is always um, a dispute uh, between in in, an, in a negotiation, but the concept of res of reasonable foreseeability often is used to allocate the risks between buyer and seller. For example, I had a transaction recently where the buyer did think that they could hold the seller liable for anything under the sun that happened after the transactions closed if it 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 happened during the time. Um, that my client, the seller, owned the business. They proposed language that our clients would hold them harmless for any claim, assertion, loss, liability, deficiency, on and on and on that occurred after closing, but related to the period before closing. And then we were able to get them to assert four words into uh, the language in the document that limited our client's liability considerably. The buyers agreed our clients were only liable for damage result resulting from those matters that were reasonably foreseeable. Of course, there was a possibility we would dispute later what reasonable foreseeab foreseeability meant, but that's been adjudicated many times and we weren't too concerned about having to define it specifically because it, 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 it's definable as, as in legal cases. So the concept of reasonable foreseeability, whether it's an ox that is known to hurt others, a train that may cross the tracks when a herd of cattle is coming through, or a seller who is trying to limit its rights to future liability, fo focuses typically on an individual uh, and, and on a, a situation between only two parties, one ox, one owner, one injured person, and so on. However, as we were studying the Masechet, I began to think about how or whether the concept of reasonable foreseeability can be extended to the community. Can a community consider themselves warned for prior actions and be responsible to act prudently to mitigate such action in the future? So the logical extension of this concept to the world we live in now is to look at October 7th, 2023 as the forewarning, requiring us to act prudently to mitigate the damage. On a personal level, my husband and I heeded this warning by spending time in Israel volunteering this past January, housing evacuees in our home in Jerusalem and listening to our friends and family as they described their lives since October 7th. We plan to return during Pesach for more volunteer work and then to make Aliyah at the beginning of July. Learning the Masechet of Baba Kama for the first time during this communal warning and call to action will stay with me for the rest of my life. And the lessons I have learned by integrating my knowledge as a lawyer and my commitment and compassion as a Jew, I am certain have changed forever how I will read Baba Kama. Thank you. Thank you, Terry. That's really beautiful. Thank you. As always, it's so always amazing to hear learners take their light, their their perspective in life and bring it into the Gemara and, and pull it all together so beautifully. Thank you. Um, okay, before we do the last part, which is we're going to end with Tfilot, I just want to add a few more thank yous. I want to thank you, Fitornik family, for dedicating the Masechet, in memory of their fathers and grandfathers, Philip Kaufman and David Fitornik, 
I want to thank our sponsors again for tonight, for tonight's Seam, the Schisters and the Freedmans. And I want to thank all our learners for all your amazing commitment through these difficult times, coming every day, coming on the Zoom, coming, listening, whatever time of day works for you and staying committed to Talmud Torah. And uh, thank you for all your support and, and for being there. And with that, we're going to invite three of our learners, Sarah Averick, Anne Mursky, and Dina Levy, to lead us in the tweet love. Maggie, you're going to share? I, I said to Michelle uh, before the last Zoom, can you hear me? Um, that I hope the next Zoom we're saying hello and not these two though. הקדוש ברוך הוא ישמור ויציל את חיילנו מכל צרה וצוקה, מכל נגע ומחרה. וישלח ברכה וצלחה בחום על פי ידיהם. יד ברצון אינו תחתיהם, ויתרם בחדר ישועה ובתרת ביטחון. ויקוים בהם הכתוב, כי אדוני אלוהיכם ההולכם לכם להילחם לכם עם אויביכם להושיע אתכם, ונאמר אמן. יהי רצון מלפניך, אדוני אלוהינו ואלוהי אבותינו, שתשלח מהרה רפואה שלמה מן השמיים, רפואת הנפש ורפואת הגוף, לכל הפצועים במערכה. הקדוש ברוך הוא ימלא רחמים עליהם, להחלימם ולרפאותם ולהחזיקם ולהחיותם, וישלח להם מהרה רפואה שלמה מן השמיים לכל אבריהם ולכל גידיהם בתוך שאר חולי ישראל, רפואת הנפש ורפואת הגוף, השתא בעגלה ובזמן קריב, ונאמר אמן. אמן. שתחזק ותשמור ותנצור את אחינו בישראל, השבויים והשבויות, בעבור שאנו מתפללים בעבורם, הקדוש ברוך הוא ימלא רחמים עליהם, ישמרם מכל צרה וצוקה ומכל נגע ומחלה, וישלח ברכה והצלחה בכל מעשה ידיהם, יוציאי מחושך וצל מוות, וישיבי מהרה לחיק משפחותיהם, ונאמר אמן. אמן. Please join me from your, from your homes as we sing. אחינו כל בית ישראל, אחינו כל בית ישראל, הנתונים בצרה, בצרה ובשביה. העומדים בין בים ובין ביבשה. המעקם ירחם, ירחם עליהם, ויוציא מצרה לירווחו, ומאפר על יורא ומשיבוד לגאולה השתא. Ba'agala uvizman kariv Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone.
Mazato to everyone completing the message. People can unmute if you want. Mazato, thank you. Thank you. Thank you as always, Mazato, to everyone. Very much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank 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 you. Thank